All right, to summarize uh, what we talked about today, one thing, we had all those different dots on our graph, and they were all in different places, even though we all did the same process to get the number, okay? And what that's called is sampling variability. That means in different samples, you get different estimates. And that just makes sense. We're not all going to draw the exact same numbers in the exact same order to get the exact same answer. To help reduce some of this variability, we want to take larger sample size to get a more accurate estimate. You should probably have sample sizes greater than 30. That's That helps the most. And there's something called a margin of error. So your margin of error creates an interval of plausible values of we think if we did this again we'd get an answer between here and here and it gives you kind of a high and a low probable values that you should be between okay you see that on a lot of presidential polls and so this would be a margin of error would be if you took whatever your sample in estimate is so ours was negative 1.1 and then there's a way to calculate a margin of error in there. So you get a range of plausible values that the population could be if we, and, and if we repeated our um, simulation or study. All right. The other part of this is just kind of summarizing about statistically significant. This is a little bit of a review. So remember, statistically significant results from a, st uh, results from a study are too unusual to have cured purely by chance. Yes, it's possible, but it's really, really, really unlikely. Okay, so this was kind of like a summary of what we did is we had a value and you want to know from that value or more extreme, how many of the numbers occurred there. If we had been asking about a value on this side, we would have gone the other way. Okay, and so remember, less than 5% is statistically significant, greater than 5% is not statistically significant. All right, and we are going to continue with this idea through the whole rest of the course, so it doesn't go away. So what I want you to try, pause the video, try to check your understanding. It's really helpful if you do it all on your own and then come back to see how you did. All right, so how much do National Football League players weigh on average? In a random sample of 50 NFL players, the average weight was 244.4 pounds. So do you think that 244 is the true average weight of all NFL players? No, we took a sample of 50, and that was just one sample. If we sampled again and pulled 50 people, we would probably get a different number. It'd be unlikely to continue to get that same number. It would be different depending on who we pulled. Okay. Now, if another random sample of 50 NFL players, would you... Ex well, so that, that's what we're talking about. These both are kind of asking the same thing. All samples are different. Since we don't have the whole population, we don't expect, expect, expect the sample mean to be the same. And if we draw another sample, every sample is different. That's sampling variability. Okay. Now, estimates are usually given with a margin of error. The margin of error is an estimate of 244 pounds is 14.2 pounds. So remember what I was saying up here. You take your sample estimate and add or subtract the margin of error. Would you be surprised if somebody weighed if the true average weight was 260 pounds? Yes, because with that margin of error, we would expect weights to be between two to true, the true average between 229.8 and 258.2. 260 is outside that range, so that would be surprising if we had that happen. All right, and then our last question. Which would be more likely to give an estimate close to the true average weight of all NFL players? Random sample of 50 players or a random sample of 100 players? Well, a random sample of 100 players because larger samples produce more accurate estimates. All right, I hope that was help helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.